In Bologna, as in every other place, the emperor knew how to endear himself to all by his moderation, his justice, and the generous grace with which he recognized the slightest service. All the inhabitants of Bologna, all the peasants of the neighborhood, would have let themselves be killed for him. His slightest peculiarities were the subject of their conversation, and yet his conduct one day excited complaints. He was unjust. He was universally blamed. His injustice had caused so many disasters. I'm going to give a faithful report of this sad event, of which I did not witness any part. One morning, on mounting his horse, the emperor announced that he would hold a review of the naval forces and gave orders to have the vessels forming the line of blockade leave their positions as he intended to review them in open sea. He set out with Rustam for his usual ride and expressed a desire that all should be ready on his return, the hour of which he designated. Everybody knew that the emperor's desire was his will. Someone went during his absence to transmit it to Admiral Brie, who responded with imperturbable coolness that he was very sorry, but that the review would not take place that day. Consequently, not a vessel stirred. On returning from his ride, the emperor inquired if all was ready. He was told that the admiral had replied. He had this reply twice repeated to him. He was unaccustomed to the tone of it. And stamping violently, he sent for the admiral who presented himself at once. He did not come quickly enough to suit the emperor, however, and he met him halfway from his barrack. The staff were following his majesty and ranged themselves silently around him. His eyes shot lightning. Mr. Admiral, said the emperor in an agitated voice, why have you not executed my orders? Sire, replied Admiral Bree with respectful firmness, there is a horrible tempest brewing. Your Majesty can see it as well as I can. Do you wish to expose the lives of so many brave fellows without necessity? As a matter of fact, the heaviness of the atmosphere and the dull rumbling in the distance justified the fears of the Admiral. But too well. Sir, replied the Emperor, more and more irritated, I gave orders once more. Why have you not executed them? The consequences concern me alone. Obey. Sire, I will not obey. Sire, you are insolent. Sir, you are insolent. And the emperor, who still held his whip in his hand, advanced towards the admiral with a threatening gesture. Admiral Louis drew back a step and laid his hand on the hilt of his sword. Sire, he said, turning pale, take care. The emperor, motionless for a time, his hand raised, fixed his eye on the admiral, who on his side maintained his terrible attitude. At last, the emperor threw his whip on the ground. Monsieur Brie let go of the hilt of his sword and with uncovered head awaited the result of this horrible scene. Mr. Rear Admiral Megan said the Emperor, you will have the movement I ordered executed on the instant. As to you, sir, continued he, bringing back his glance to Admiral Brie, you will leave Bologna within 24 hours and retire to Holland. Go. His Majesty withdrew at once. Some officers, but not very many, shook the hand of the Admiral, held out to them in parting. Meanwhile, Rear Admiral Megan caused the fleet to perform the fatal maneuver required by the emperor. Hardly were the first steps taken when the sea became frightful to behold. The heavily clouded sky was furrowed with lightnings and thunder roared every instant and the wind broke up all the lines. At last occurred what the admiral had foreseen and the most fearful tempest dispersed the vessels in such a manner as to render the situation desperate. The emperor with down bent Head and crossed arms was walking the beach when terrible cries were suddenly heard. More than 20 gunboats crowded with soldiers and sailors had just been cast ashore and the unfortunates whom they had carried were struggling against the furious waves, crying for aid that no one dared to give them. Profoundly touched by this spectacle, his heart torn by the lamentations of the immense crowd drawn by the tempest to the cliffs and the shore, the emperor who saw his generals and officers shivering with horror around him, Resolved to set the example of devotion, and in spite of every effort made to detain him, he threw himself into a lifeboat, saying, Let me alone, let me alone. Someone must get them out. His boat filled with water in an instant. The waves passed and repassed above it, and the emperor was drenched. A billow still stronger than the others narrowly missed carrying. His majesty overboard, and his hat was thrown into the water. Electrified by such courage, officers, soldiers, sailors, and citizens flew to the rescue, some in boats and some by swimming, but alas, 
but a small number of the unfortunates who had composed the crew of the gunboats could be saved, and the next day the sea threw back on the beach more than 200 corpses, along with the hat of the victor of Marengo. This sad morrow was a day of desolation for Bologna and for the camp. There was no one who did not hasten to the shore, searching anxiously among the corpses heaped up by the waves. The emperor groaned over so many disasters, which interiorly he doubtless could not fail to attribute to his own obstinacy. Agents provided with gold went by his orders through the city and the camp to prevent the murmurs that were all ready to break out. That day I saw a drummer belonging to the crew of the shipwrecked shallop come back on his drum as if... It had been a raft. The poor devil had his thigh broken. He had remained more than 12 hours in this horrible situation. To finish up with the camp of Bologna, I will relate here what did not in reality happen until the month of August, 1805, after the return of the emperor from his journey and his coronation in Italy. Soldiers and sailors were burning with impatience to embark for England. But the desired moment did not arrive. Every evening they said to each other, Tomorrow there will be a good wind. It will be foggy and we shall depart. And they fell asleep in that hope. Day would break with sun or rain. One evening, however, when the favorable wind was blowing, I heard two sailors chatting together on the wharf, indulging in conjectures about the future. The emperor would do well to start tomorrow, said one. He will never have better weather. There will surely be a fog. Boss said the other. He does not even think of it. It is more than a fortnight since the fleet has budged. They don't want to start so soon. And yet all the munitions are on board. Everything could be unmoored in a jiffy. They came to place the night sentinels and the conversation of the two old sea dogs stopped there. But I soon had reason to recognize that their experience had not deceived them. In fact, toward... Three o'clock in the morning, a light fog overspread the sea, which was a little rough. The wind of the previous day sprang up again. At daybreak, the fog thickened so as to hide the fleet from the English. The most profound silence reigned everywhere. Not a single unfriendly sail had been signaled during the night, and as the sailors had said, everything favored the descent. At five o'clock in the morning, signals came from a semaphore. In a twinkling, all the seamen were stirring. The harbor resounded with shouts of joy. The order to depart had been received. While the sails were being hoisted, the general was beaten in the four camps. The whole army was called to arms and came down precipitously into the city, hardly believing what they had just heard. We are going to start then, said all these valiant fellows. We are going to say two words to those blank of English. And the pleasure that moved them expressed itself in acclamations, which were silenced by a rolling of the drums. The embarkation took place in profound silence and in an orderly manner, which I should vainly try to describe. In seven hours, 200,000 soldiers were aboard the fleet, and when a little after midday this fine army was about to start out, Amid the farewells and good wishes of the entire city assembled on the wharves and on the cliffs at the moment when all the soldiers, standing with uncovered heads, were detaching themselves from French soil to the cry of, Long live the emperor! A message arrived from the imperial barrack, which disembarked the troops and sent them back to camp. A telegraphic dispatch received that very moment by his majesty obliged him to give another direction to his troops. The soldiers returned sadly to their quarters. Some of them testified loudly and in a very energetic manner. The disappointment caused them by this species of mystification. They had always regarded the success of the enterprise against England as a thing completely certain. And to see themselves arrested at the instant of departure was in their eyes the greatest misfortune that could happen. When all was in order, the emperor repaired to the right camp. And there he made a proclamation in presence of the truce, which was carried to the other camps and posted everywhere. This was the tenor of it. Brave soldiers of the camp of Bologna, you will not go to England. English gold has seduced the Emperor of Austria, who has just declared war on France. His army has broken the line it was to keep. Bavaria is invaded. Soldiers, new laurels await you beyond the Rhine. Let us speed to conquer from the enemy. We have conquered already. This proclamation was received with universal transports. All frowns vanished. 
It mattered little to these intrepid men whether they were led to Austria or to England. They were thirsting to fight. War was proclaimed. All their desires were satisfied. Thus vanished all those grand schemes for a descent on England, ripened so long, so wisely planned. It is not doubtful now that with time and perseverance the enterprise would have been crowned with the greatest success. But it was not to be. Several regiments remained at Bologna, and while their brethren were overthrowing the Austrians, they erected a column on the beach destined long to recall the souvenir of Napoleon and his immortal army. Directly after the proclamation of which I have just spoken, His Majesty gave orders to make all ready for his approaching departure. The Grand Marshal of the Palace was directed to examine and pay all the expenses incurred by the Emperor or which he had cause to be incurred during his different sojourns, not without being recommended, as usual, to take care not to overpay, or pay too dear. I think I have said already that His Majesty was extremely economical in all that concerned him personally, and that he was afraid of spending 20 francs without some very useful end in view. Among many other accounts to be regulated, the Grand Marshal of the Palace found that Monsieur Sordi, engineer of military communications, who had been directed by him to undertake the interior and exterior decorations of His Majesty's barrack. The bill amounted to 50,000 francs. The Grand Marshal uttered cries of horror at this alarming total. He would not settle Monsieur Sordi's bill and dismissed him, saying that he could not authorize the payment without first having taken the emperor's orders. The engineer withdrew after assuring the grand marshal that he had not overcharged for any article and that he had followed his instructions literally. He added that in this state of things, he could not possibly make the least reduction. The next day, Monsieur Sordi received orders to present himself before the emperor. The emperor was in his barrack, the subject of the discussion. He had under his eyes not the account of the engineer, but a map on which he was following the future march of his army. Monsieur Sordi came and was introduced by General Caffarelli. The half-open door permitted the general, and me also, to hear the conversation about to begin. Sir, said his majesty, you have spent a great deal too much money in decorating this wretched barrack. Yes, certainly a great deal too much. Fifty thousand francs? Do you think of that, sir? That is frightful. I will not have you paid. The engineer, dumbfounded by this brusque rush into the subject, did not at first know what to reply. Happily, the emperor, by casting his eyes once more at the unrolled map, gave him time to collect himself. He responded, Sire, the gold clouds which formed the ceiling of this room, all this took place in the council chamber, and which surrounded the guiding star of your majesty, did in fact cost 20,000 francs. But if I had consulted the heart of your subjects, the imperial eagle, which is again about to crush the enemies of France and of your throne, would have spread its wings in the midst of the rarest diamonds. That is all very well, replied the emperor, laughing. It is very well, but I will not pay you at present. And since you tell me that this eagle, which costs so dear, ought to crush the Austrians, wait till it does so, and I will pay your bill with the rix dollars of the emperor of Germany and the gold Fredericks of the king of Prussia. And his majesty, resuming his compass, began to make his army move over the map. As a matter of fact, the engineer's account was not settled until after the Battle of Austerlitz, and then, as the emperor had said, in Rick's dollars and Frederick's. Chapter 19. Toward the end of November, the emperor set out from Bologna to make an excursion into Belgium and to rejoin the empress, who had gone to aix la chapelle Everywhere along his route, he was received not merely with the honors reserved for crowned heads, but in addition with acclamations intended for his person rather than his power. I shall say nothing of the numerous fetes given him during his journey, nor of the noteworthy things that occurred. These details can be found everywhere, and I wish to speak only of what is personal to me, or at least of what is not known to each and all. Let it suffice me then to say that we passed through a rest. Valenciennes, Mont, Bruxelles, E.T., in triumph as it were. At the gate of each city, the municipal council presented the emperor with the wine of honor, the keys of the place. We remained several days at Lincoln, and being only five leagues from a lost, a little town where I had relatives, I asked his majesty's permission to leave him for 24 hours, which he granted, but with difficulty. A lost... 
Like the rest of Belgium at this period, professed the greatest attachment for the emperor. I scarcely had a moment to myself. I was staying at the house of one of my friends, Mr. D., whose family had long been in one of the chief employments of the Belgian government. I think the whole town came there to visit me. But I was not vain enough to attribute to myself all the honor of this cordiality. They wanted to know even the least details that related to the great man near whom I was placed. I was extraordinarily fettered on this account, and my 24 hours passed too quickly. On my return, His Majesty deigned to put a thousand questions about the town of Alost and its inhabitants, what they thought of his government and his person. I could answer him without flattery that he was adored. He seemed pleased and talked kindly to me about my family and my petty interests. We left Lakin the next day and passed through Alost. If I could have foreseen... That the day before, I might have stayed there several hours longer. However, the emperor had made so much difficulty about granting a single day that I should probably have not dared venture on more, even if I had known that the household was to pass through the town. The emperor liked Lake, and he had considerable repairs and embellishments made there, and through his efforts, this place became a charming place of abode. This journey of their majesties lasted nearly three months. We did not return to Paris, or rather to saint Cloud until sometime in October. At Cologne and Koblenz, the emperor had received a visit of several German princes and princesses. But as I could only know by hearsay what passed in these interviews, I had determined not to speak of them when there fell into my hands a manuscript in which the author enters into all the details of which I could have no cognizance. This is how I found myself possessor of this curious journal. It seems that one of the ladies of Her Majesty, the Empress Josephine, knows Noted down daily everything interesting that happened in the interior of the palace and the imperial family. These souvenirs, among which occur many unflattering portraits, were brought to the emperor's notice, probably, as it was supposed at the time, by the indiscretion and unfaithfulness of a chambermaid. Their majesties were very severely, and to my mind, very unjustly treated in the memoirs of Madame a Blank. Hence, the emperor flew into a violent rage, and Madame Blank received her dismissal. The day when his majesty read these manuscripts in his bedroom at St. Cloud, his secretary, who was accustomed to carry all papers into his majesty's cabinet, doubtless forgot a rather small paper book, which I found on the floor near the emperor's bathtub. This paper book was nothing less than the account of the journey of the empress to Aix-la-Chapelle, a relation which apparently formed part of the memoirs of Madame Blanc. As we were just starting for Paris, and moreover, his papers negligently forgotten and not missed did not seem to be of great importance, I threw them into the upper part of the armoire of the cabinet, which was seldom open, and concerned myself no further about them. It seems that nobody thought more of them than I did, for it was not until two years afterwards that in searching every corner of his bedchamber in search of some mislaid object, my eyes fell upon the dusty manuscript of Madame Blank. The emperor's thoughts were very remote at that time from the petty vexations of 1805, and I did not feel myself guilty of a great indiscretion in taking the manuscript home with me, and I hope nobody will be displeased at finding it annexed to my memoirs. At the same time, I protest here in advance against any interpretation which would tend to make me jointly responsible for the opinions of Madame Blanc. She belonged to the number of those persons who, belonging to the old regime, either individually or through their family ties, had thought they could accept their even solicit appointments in the emperor's household without renouncing their prejudices or their hatred for him. This hatred has led the author of the journey into more than one unjust exaggeration concerning whatever relates to their majesties and i have replied in several notes to things that to me seem inexact in her criticisms in what refers to the german princes and some other personages madame blank impresses me as having been ingeniously truthful although a little too jeering Diary of the Journey to Mayence, Paris, July 1st, 1804. I took my oath today at St. Cloud as Lady of the Empress's Palace at the same time when Monsieur 
Dabusson took his as Chamberlain. Madame de la Rochefoucauld was the only person who witnessed the ceremony which took place in the blue salon in a rather gay manner. Josephine was very gracious about it. She had formerly met Monsieur de Busson in society, and she seemed to find it very pleasant to renew acquaintance with him by receiving his oath as empress. She speaks of her elevation very frankly, very becomingly. She said to us with delightful artlessness that it was very unpleasant to her to remain seated when women who were formerly her equals or even her superiors entered her apartments that she was required to conform to this etiquette, but that she found it quite impossible. Madame de la Rochefoucauld, who had to be entreated for a long time before she would accept the place of lady of honor, and who yielded only to affection for Josephine, has given herself infinite pains to bring the whole Falberg Saint Germain to this court. It was she who persuaded Monsieur de Besson. He had wished to enter the service as a colonel. He was rather surprised to receive an appointment as Chamberlain instead of a regiment. All Paris occupies itself with the formation of the households of the emperor and the empress. Every day one hears of some family of the old court which is going to form a part of this one. The embarrassment with which people accost persons of their acquaintance is curious enough. Uncertain whether they have received appointments, one does not like to boast of his own. But on learning there is one is enchanted. It is one weapon more for the sheaf. They would like to form an opposition to the malicious pleasantries of the Falberg Saint Germain. July 8, 1804, Madame de la Rochefoucauld related a rather amusing adventure this morning. She had just made a call on Madame de Balbi. The latter, enchanted to find a chance to throw a stone into her garden, said to her, Madame de Bouillet has just gone away. I told her the people in society were mentioning her as a lady of the palace, but she denied it in a way that proved to me that they were in the wrong. Madame de la Rochefoucauld had with her at the very moment the letter in which Madame de Bouillet asked for this place. She replied, I do not know why Madame de Bouillet denies it, for here is her application and her appointment. July 14th, 1804. What a fatiguing day! We were assembled at the chateau at 11 o'clock to accompany the empress to the church of the Invalide. To witness the distribution of the decorations of the Legion of Honor, seated in a tribune opposite the Emperor's throne, we saw him receive 1,900 chevaliers. This ceremony was interrupted for an instant by the arrival of a man of the people, wearing a simple jacket, who presented himself on the steps of the throne. Napoleon paused in surprise. Someone questioned the man who showed his brevet, and he received the accolade and his decoration. The cortege followed the same road on returning, passing through the grand alley of the Tuileries. It was the first time that Bonaparte has entered the garden in a carriage. On re-entering the apartments of the Empress, he approached the window. Some children who were on the terrace, seeing him, shouted, Long live the Emperor! He drew back with very perceptible ill humor, saying, I am the worst large sovereign in Europe. No one has ever thought of allowing the public to come so near his palace. I must confess that if I had arrived at the Tuileries in the way that Napoleon has, I should have thought it were suitable not to seem to find myself ill lodged. I do not know whether it was because this little spurt of ill humor lasted, but on entering the circle which we formed, he approached Madame de la Valla, <laughs> Madame de la Vallette. And kicking the bottom of her dress, he said, Fie, madame, what a dress, what a trimming. It is in the very worst taste. Madame de la Vallette seemed a little disconcerted. In the evening, we went up to the balcony of the middle pavilion to hear the concert that was given in the garden. After some moments, the emperor took a whim to the, see the statues of the Louvre by torchlight. Monsieur Dinant, who was there, received his orders. The footmen carried torches. We crossed the Grand Gallery and went down into the halls of the antiques. In passing through them, Napoleon paused a long time. Before a bust of Alexander, there was a sort of affectation in his calling or attention to the fact that necessarily his this head was bad, that it was too large, Alexander being much smaller than himself. He dwelt greatly on those words, much smaller. I was at a little distance, but I had heard him. Having come near, he absolutely repeated the phrase. He seemed charmed to inform us that he was larger than Alexander. Ah, how small he seemed to me at that moment. July 15th, 1804. This evening, I was at a house where Princess Dulgaruki came on leaving the drawing room. At the Tuileries, someone asked her what she thought about it. It is certainly a great power, she responded. But it is not a great court. 
Harris, July blank, 1804 blank. The Empress starts tomorrow to go and see the flatboats at Bologna and the Empress for aix la chapelle where she will take the waters. I must accompany her. Rems, July blank, 1804 blank. This morning before leaving St. Cloud, the Empress crossed two halls to give an order to a person occupying a rather subaltern position in her household. Monsieur Darville, her grand equerry, came up in a fright to represent to her that Her Majesty would totally compromise the dignity of the throne and that she ought to give her orders through his lips. Yes, sir, said Josephine gaily. This etiquette is perfect for princesses born on the throne and accustomed to the restraint which it imposes. But I, who have had the good luck to live so many years as a private person, I think it well to give my orders sometimes without an interpreter. The Grand Equerry bowed, and we set out. Sit July 30th, 1804. This morning I found Josephine very busily reading a large sheet of manuscript. And I was not a little surprised to see that she was learning her lesson. Whenever she travels, everything is fixed for scene in advance. It is known in what place she must be harangued by such or such an authority. Here she must respond in such a manner, there in such another. All is regulated, even the presence she must make. But it is sometimes happens that her memory fails her. And then, if her response is not as suitable as that which had been prepared... It is at least always made with such courtesy and kindness that people are always satisfied. Liege, August 1st, 1804. I feared that we should never get here. The emperor, without informing himself as to whether a projected road through the forest of our den had been completed, had traced ours on the map. The relays were arranged according to his orders, and we were 20 times in danger of having our carriages smashed. In several places, they were kept up with ropes. No one ever imagined making women travel like dragoon officers.